In late June, Sri Lanka's Prime Minister, Ranil Rikramin Singh, announced that the country's economy had collapsed. There was no money left to pay for imports of necessities like food, fuel and medicine, and the country was seeking help from neighbouring countries and the IMF. Rick Reminsing, who had taken office in May, emphasized the monumental scale of the task the country faced in turning around an economy he said was heading for rock bottom. Sri Lanka is going through its worst economic crisis since it gained independence from Britain almost 75 years ago. Protesters have been on the streets for the last five months, furious about the economic mismanagement, the corruption, the authoritarianism and the nepotism of the Rajapaksa brothers, who've dominated Sri Lankan politics for decades. In July, videos emerged on social media showing people taking over the presidential palace. We saw protesters in palace bedrooms, at the palace gym and swimming in the palace swimming pool. The sheer scale of the protests and the anger of the population prompted Gotabaya Rajapaksa, the president at the time, to flee the country on a military jet to the Maldives and later to Singapore where he turned in his resignation by email. Sri Lanka's economic collapse has been blamed on the Rajapaksa brothers for heavily borrowing to build Chinese-backed projects, for their corrupt mismanagement of the economy and for their ill-considered policy making, which included a ban on fertilizer imports in 2019. When Gotabaya Rajapaksa resigned, MPs replaced him with the Prime Minister Rick Reminsing, who I mentioned earlier, a man that protesters hated so much that they burnt down his house a few weeks ago. With its foreign currency reserves depleted, Sri Lanka, a nation of 22 million people, has run out of money to import fuel and other necessities, leading to queues miles long at petrol stations and daily power cuts. The fuel shortage has put people out of work and forced the country's schools, offices and companies to close. People have been asked to work and attend school remotely, but a lack of IT infrastructure and reliable power make this impossible for most. Sri Lankans are skipping meals and lining up for hours every day to buy the scarce supplies that they need. This is a harsh new reality for a country that had a growing and comfortable middle class until the latest crisis enveloped them. The country's official inflation rate is reported as being just under 55%, but one estimate from Johns Hopkins University estimated inflation at over 130% in March. In such a situation, citizens are seeing their wealth evaporate into thin air. According to the FT, roughly half of Sri Lankans will be classified as poor by the end of the year, a shocking reversal for a country that was until recently classified as upper middle income. While demonstrators accused Gotabaya Rajapaksa of mismanaging the economy, the president's older brother Mahinda Rajapaksa, who had previously been a president and prime minister of the country, accused the citizens themselves of deepening the nation's financial plight. Friends, every second you protest on the streets, our country loses opportunities to receive potential dollars, he said in a broadcast in April. Sri Lanka's economy was, until recently, growing. It took off after the nation's brutal civil war ended and tourists discovered how beautiful the country is. Lonely Planet listed it as the top tourist destination of the year in 2019. Its main economic sectors are tourism, tea export, clothing and agricultural products. Additionally, remittances from overseas employment, especially in the Middle East, contribute significantly to the economy, bringing in badly needed foreign exchange. Industrialization increased the importance of sectors like food processing, textiles, telecommunications and finance to the economy over time, and Sri Lanka was listed as the second wealthiest country in South Asia, just behind the Maldives in terms of GDP per capita. So what went wrong? Well, there's not just one factor to blame for the problem Sri Lanka faces today. Instead, a number of internal and external issues hit the economy all at once over the last few years, which contributed to the economic collapse that we see right now.
Unfortunately, there's a long list of other highly indebted countries around the world today who might find themselves in a similar situation, having to choose between subsidizing essential goods for their populations and paying their creditors. We'll talk about those countries in just a moment. Sri Lanka's long-standing high debt and large civil service have for a long time contributed to very high budget deficits. Additionally, the country's focus on domestic goods, things like the construction sector, instead of export growth, only increased Sri Lanka's trade imbalance. Sri Lanka now imports $3 billion more than it exports every year, and that's part of the reason that it's run out of foreign currency. Tourism was a key sector of the Sri Lankan economy, but the Easter bombings in 2019 and the global pandemic which struck in 2020 combined to halt this key industry, which had been counted on to bring a lot of foreign currency into the economy. Godabaya Rajapaksa promised when he was elected that he would deliver a prosperous nation. His main approach to achieving this was through instituting the largest tax cuts in Sri Lankan history. Rajapaksa cut both VAT and income taxes in 2019. The tax cuts were later reversed, but only after creditors downgraded the country, blocking it from borrowing more money while its foreign reserves were sinking. In an extremely controversial move, he banned the use and the import of synthetic fertilizers in a bid to become the first country in the world to fully adopt organic farming. Now, while this ban was also quickly rolled back, only a small amount of synthetic fertilizer made it to farms in time and crop yields were severely affected. The lack of fertilizer led to a significant drop in tea production and important export, Rice production, a food staple in the country, plummeted too, forcing the government to spend $450 million of foreign reserves on rice imports. With the country's revenues slashed and credit rating falling, the government struggled to refinance its foreign debt. Now, before we discuss the foreign debt, let me quickly tell you about today's video sponsor, Morning Brew. As I'm sure you can imagine, I'm a big consumer of financial news, and Morning Brew is an amazing way to get up to speed on what's going on first thing every morning. Instead of aimlessly browsing social media, sign up for Morning Brew. It's a totally free daily newsletter delivered seven days a week. They get you up to speed on business, finance, and tech news in around five minutes each morning. It's become one of my favorite news sources. They had a great piece recently on Sri Lanka that inspired this video. Sign up using the link in the description below. Now, there were other big problems in Sri Lanka too. The Rajapaksa family had been borrowing money for years and spending it on white elephant projects. Lotus Tower, the tallest communications tower in South Asia, was built at a cost of $105 million in the capital city, Colombo. It was supposed to be used for communication, observation, and other leisure activities. It was ceremonially opened in 2019, but remains out of operation today. It stands as a monument to malinvestment in the country. There was also a monorail project proposed at a cost of $1.3 billion, which luckily never began construction, as it would have been almost as wasteful a project as the Las Vegas Loop. Well, maybe not quite that bad, but you know what I mean. A deserted four-lane highway in Sri Lanka leads to Hambantota, the home region of the Rajapaksa family, where an unused convention centre, a massive international airport, and a 35,000-seater cricket stadium, which has hosted less than three games a year since it was opened in 2011, sit. All are empty and rotting away in the heat. There's also a $3.1 billion port, which was financed by China and is now controlled by Beijing after the Sri Lankan government incurred heavy losses and gave up on funding it in 2017. 
These projects were all built using money borrowed from China as part of the Belt and Road Initiative and have now become a burden to the nation. The issue is not just the unpaid debts, but the ongoing cost of maintenance required to preserve any value these white elephant projects may still have. Newspapers in Sri Lanka claim that 20% of the money borrowed went as kickbacks, being paid as commissions to the Rajapaksa family and their associates. The family borrowed heavily overseas to spend lavishly in their home region of just 600,000 people, and it appears that they spent the money on projects that would make them and their associates rich rather than benefit the overall economy. Political corruption is a huge problem for the country, as not only did it play a role in squandering the wealth of the nation, but it also complicates any possible financial rescue for Sri Lanka. Any assistance from the IMF or World Bank would come with strict conditions to make sure the aid isn't mismanaged. The final two blows to the Sri Lankan economy came from external events. Russia's invasion of Ukraine caused energy, food and fertilizer prices to skyrocket. The highest inflation in 40 years in the United States caused the Federal Reserve to hike interest rates aggressively. These two events made conditions particularly difficult in emerging markets like Sri Lanka. The war in Ukraine meant inflation in Sri Lanka and higher rates in the US pushed up borrowing costs worldwide and drove the US dollar higher. This means that any trade invoiced in US dollars is more expensive and dollar-denominated debt is more difficult to service. Sri Lanka defaulted on its debt in May, having chosen to use its remaining foreign reserves to pay for staples rather than to pay creditors. So what happens then when a country defaults? Well, the Paris Club is an informal group of creditor nations that meets each month in Paris to find workable solutions to payment problems faced by debtor nations. Their process of restructuring debt, which was established in the 1950s, typically falls under what's known as the Common Framework, where the negotiation is held in an open and transparent manner and the creditors coordinate their engagement with the debtor country and all agree to the same terms of a debt restructuring, which involves some form of debt relief. China, however, is not a member of the Paris Club and has a different way of dealing with countries who are having trouble meeting their debt service obligations. Sri Lanka, like many emerging markets, owes a lot of money to China, who accounts for around 10% of the country's foreign debt. The other big bilateral lenders are Japan and India, followed by the Asian Development Bank. It's difficult to know the exact amount owed to China as they don't disclose their deals. The World Bank estimates that around the world almost a quarter of emerging and developing countries' external debt is owed to China and they've so far been reluctant to restructure any of it. Sri Lanka's debt talks will be closely watched as a test of how Beijing works with creditors who are in distress, as they've made a lot of emerging market loans which are under strain due to rising inflation and the fallout from the war in Ukraine. I covered that in my last video. Sri Lanka's default has left many investors wondering who the next sovereign borrower to go into restructuring will be. Foreign investors have been pulling money out of emerging markets for five straight months now. This is the longest streak of withdrawals on record. It highlights how recession fears and rising interest rates are shaking developing economies. Beyond Sri Lanka, there's a long list of vulnerable countries, more than 20 of whom have foreign bond yields over 10%. Spreads on foreign bonds issued by Ghana, for example, have more than doubled this year as investors price in a rising risk of default or restructuring. Pakistan, Ghana, Egypt and Tunisia are all in rescue talks with the IMF right now. The severity of the crisis means that Sri Lanka is seeking $1.5 billion from its biggest bilateral lenders, China, India and Japan, in bridge financing so that they can resume imports of badly needed fuel. 
Sri Lanka needs large-scale, long-term economic restructuring. And for that to happen, the government will have to negotiate a working deal with China, as the IMF is not going to give Sri Lanka money so that it can be used to pay off its debt to China or any other entity. The Chinese government is aware that cutting any deal with Sri Lanka will mean that other countries that owe them money will expect similar deals, and Beijing obviously would rather not set a precedent on this. China will most likely have to work with Sri Lanka and other lenders, especially once there's a new government in place, as China will want to cultivate goodwill and maintain influence in a strategically important country, and probably won't want to be seen as exacerbating Sri Lanka's problems. If you found today's video interesting, you should watch my recent video on the weaponization of the US dollar. Don't forget to sign up for Morning Brew using the link in the description below. It's totally free, so there's no reason not to try it out. See you again soon. Bye.